12 News at 10 starts right now. Tonight we continue our coverage of teen violence in the Valley with new developments tonight in Gilbert. Good evening and thanks so much for joining us for 12 News at 10. I'm Karina Devine. I'm Mark Curtis. At the beginning of the year, the town created a subcommittee on teen violence and now that they've concluded their meetings, it's time to take action. 12 News journalist Bianca Bono is live in Gilbert tonight and Bianca, what did they end up deciding? Mark Ruby, there are a lot of ideas on the table that were generated from those subcommittee meetings, and some of them do have dates and deadlines in terms of when action will be taken, but residents say other ideas appear to be getting punted to another task force. I'm actually really disappointed. Residents frustrated by government red tape in Gilbert. It does feel like it just, they're, they're just kicking the can down the road. Since January, following the shocking death of 16-year-old Preston Lord in neighboring Queen Creek and several teen-on-teen -teen violence cases opened by the Gilbert Police Department, a newly created subcommittee on teen violence met regularly to brainstorm ideas to better protect Gilbert's youth. The subcommittee met for the last time in March, and on Tuesday night, Gilbert's full council met to decide what solutions they would enact. The community is involved. Out of tragedy has come something good is that people are paying attention. Ideas on the table. Add a police officer focused on community youth engagement, which could be added to next year's budget. Enhance partnerships between town leaders and schools and create local ordinances to ban brass knuckles for juveniles and hold parents responsible for their child's actions. Those ordinances set to be discussed at another meeting in May. How quickly could you guys potentially take action on that and then the parental responsibility ordinance as well? We could probably take action on that in the month of May. Um, hopefully for both. But much of the discussion focused on the creation of another group, a community engagement task force focusing on teen violence, which will be made up of adults and teens to further explore recommendations. There is red tape in government. That's everybody knows that and government moves slow. That's not a problem, but it does almost feel like it was pushed off onto another task force. I can definitely understand why they feel that way, but the task force is going to get to the details. You know, we just got the information from the citizens and reacted to that. So this is where the real work is going to be getting done now. And Gilbert Police Chief Michael Solberg was also present at tonight's meeting, giving an update on his department's investigation into the Gilbert Goons, the group associated with many of these teen violence incidents. They've been investigating whether the group can be considered a criminal street gang. He said the investigation is still ongoing, but expects it to be wrapped up soon. We're live in Gilbert tonight. Bianca Bono, 12 News. All right, Bianca, thank you so much for that update. Happening right now, the eastbound lanes of I-10 are closed at 7th Avenue after a man fell from an overpass. Phoenix police say that they were called to the area for reports of a man climbing a fence there above the freeway. As police were speaking to him, we're told that he fell from the overpass onto the freeway. He was taken to the hospital with serious injuries. Police say that there is no timetable to reopen the eastbound lanes as they continue their investigation. Tomorrow marks one year since Mercedes Vega was found dead in the back seat of a burning car next to the I-10 near Tonopah. And tonight, the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office is releasing new details about the murder investigation. They say the detectives have executed a search warrant on numerous accounts and devices. There was also this new revelation that Vega had abruptly canceled personal plans just before her disappearance. Detectives also revealed that in Vega's last known communication, she stated that she planned to go to work. Surveillance video from Vega's T T Tempe apartment complex shows her walking to her car. Just seconds later, she was attacked. She was found dead the next day. Vega's car was found on April 18th, about a mile from her apartment. Detectives say surveillance video shows the vehicle arriving and being left until its discovery. So far, no arrests have been made in this case. Tomorrow, the community and her family will gather to remember her life while continuing their calls for justice. They plan to hold a walk at 4 o'clock tomorrow from Margaret T. Hans Park to the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office. 
Now to our ongoing coverage of abortion in Arizona, ahead of what could be a pivotal day at the state capitol tomorrow. One week after the state Supreme Court ruled that an 1864 ban on abortion was the law, the legislature is set to meet for an initial vote on whether to repeal that ban. But first, a majority of the House, at least 31 members, have to agree to start debate on the bill. That means all 29 Democrats and at least two of the majority Republicans have to sign on. For Republicans, that means crossing their leader, House Speaker Ben Toma, who opposes the repeal. It's still unclear if there are enough votes to clear that hurdle. Those who call themselves pro-life need to stay pro-life. Um, I, I think that um, you, know, you shouldn't change your pro-life position because of your perception of, of where the political winds are. Meanwhile, Chris Love, a spokeswoman for the Arizona Abortion Access Initiative to protect reproductive rights, says her organization supports a repeal. We would hope that they would repeal the 1864 ban, hopefully with immediate effect. I'm not sure that they have the votes to do that, but quite frankly, they've had years to get this straight. If the House does approve the repeal tomorrow, the bill would be sent to the state Senate, where it could take at least a week to see any additional legislative action. And we'll continue to cover Arizona's abortion debate on air and online at 12news.com. And of course, be sure to tune in tomorrow starting at 1 p.m. as the Arizona legislature attempts to repeal Arizona's 1864 abortion ban. New at 10, Governor Katie Hobbs has vetoed a bill that would have allowed Arizona teachers to read or post copies of the Ten Commandments in the classroom. Hobbs says that Senate Bill 1151 was unnecessary, adding that she had concerns about whether it was constitutional. In a statement from the Arizona Senate Republicans, the caucus accused Hobbs of, quote, abandoning God and contributing to the cultural degradation within Arizona by vetoing the bill. All right, let's turn to our weather. Our temperature is getting ready to climb this week. We'll be flirting with the triple digits by the end of the weekend, right, Linz? That's absolutely right. Into, into early next week, those will be some of the warmest days of the year so far. We typically see our first triple digit day May 2nd. We could be early this year, but starting tomorrow, we move into the 90s, 94, and we are here to stay for at least the next seven days, and it will continue into next week. We we could see our first triple digit day by next Monday and Tuesday. Now up in Flagstaff, northern Arizona, obviously much cooler compared to the valley, but this is still above average. Low 70s Wednesday to Saturday, up to 76 degrees on Monday, and you can see nothing but sunshine. Very dry forecast for all of Arizona for the next week, so temperatures will be the big story. Here's our hour by hour Wednesday forecast. 6 a.m., we're at about 65 four degrees sunrise times at 555 a nice warm midday sunny skies expected temperatures crossing into the 90s by the mid afternoon and we have a string of 90s to look forward to over the next couple days mark thanks lens well tomorrow will be a sad day for coyotes fans the team will play what's likely to be its final home game in arizona owners have yet to confirm the move to salt lake city but fans are bracing for a possible announcement any day possibly as early as thursday 12 news journalist gabriella becara is live at mullet arena in tempe and gabby this news is breaking a lot of hearts across the state tonight that's right, Mark and Caribe. The Arizona Coyotes have built quite the hockey community in the desert over the past nearly three decades. While well, the fans I talked to are hoping these reports aren't true, they say they'd be thankful for the legacy this team would leave behind. On the ice, kids are hard at work practicing their plays. But outside the rink, there's rumblings amongst the parents about the future of hockey in Arizona. Sad. It's just sad that we're going to lose a major sports team. The Arizona Coyotes are expected to leave the state by the end of the week. I joked with my husband that, you know, we might need to move and fall him over that. Like, I can't imagine not going to hockey games. From Phoenix in 1996 to Glendale in 2003 and now Arizona State University's Mullet Arena, these fans have followed the team through all of their local moves. I feel like hockey would work here 
if we had the right ownership, if we had a, an arena. But figured a long distance jump was writing on the wall after Tempe voters rejected a proposal to build an arena in 2023 and recent pushback on development plans in North Phoenix. It's a tough pill to swallow and it's hard when neighboring cities say, I don't want you here. But they all agreed the hardest hit will be on the kids who grew from little howlers to junior coyotes. An ice touch and he came out with the biggest smile on his face and, and that it's it's been all hockey ever since. Sharing the ice den in Scottsdale has been a once in a lifetime experience for these young players. You know, they're great guys, great, you know, with the kids and it was cool for him to see and look up to that, you know what I mean? And have it so close. Parents say their passion for the sport won't dwindle. We're always going to be hockey fans. We're Definitely, you know, fans of the Coyotes for life. But it's a loss they won't soon get over. I think it'll be tough and we'll feel this for a while. You know, the, I, I think the hockey community here is, uh, is going to take it pretty hard. That anticipated last game will be played here at Mullet Arena tomorrow night. Some of the fans we spoke with say they'll be there cheering the team on. Reporting live in Tempe, Gabriela Becerra, 12 News. Gabby, thanks. This, this entire process is just so bittersweet for Coyotes fans across the state who are now coming to terms with the idea of not having hockey here. Earlier today, we posted on Facebook asking fans to share their favorite memories of the team. And we wanted to share some of their responses with you. Susie told us she's been a Coyotes fan for half of her life, despite being from Indiana, and she met her husband during a trip to the Valley for a Coyotes game. They've now been married for 10 years. They live in Chandler. She says words can't explain the excitement of being at a whiteout playoff game back in 2012. Sandra shared these photos with us. On the left, her kids, both now in their 30s, at a game when the Yotes played in downtown Phoenix. On the right, her grandkids at a game in Glendale. She says her family has supported the Coyotes since day one, and they're all sad about losing the team. And Jason shared this with us. It's a photo that holds a special place in his heart. This is the first picture he has with a woman who would become his wife at a Coyotes game together. Oh, what a sweet moment there. Well, still ahead.